Okay, good morning and welcome to another Clayton County Library System virtual program. Today we have Miss Ashley Woods uh, from Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Ms. Woods is going to be bringing to us um, information regarding stress and anxiety uh, for children, teens, and parents. She's going to help you recognize the signs of stress and anxiety in children and learn more about where you can find resources for professional help for yourself and your child. So, Ms. Woods, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, as she said, I'm Ashley Woods with. Um, BBHDD or the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And I'm currently working under the Georgia Recovery Project, which was put in place due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And give me just a second, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen so we can get started. Okay, so today's presentation is Managing Stress and Anxiety for Children, Teens, and Parents. <clears throat> Just a little more on what the Georgia Recovery Project is um, before we start. The Georgia Recovery Project is a FEMA-funded and SAMHSA-informed crisis counseling program grant that was put in place due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it provides supplemental mental health funding in the wake of a disaster. Um, we provide resources for mental health, for physical health, or whatever the resources that are needed during this COVID-19 pandemic. We support Georgians with, all, with mental health challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We provide non-therapeutic mental health support with links to more intensive support and ongoing support within the community. We do have a program manager over the entire grant. We have an emotional support line that is available every day of the week from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. With this emotional support line, you have crisis counselors that are readily available to talk and to give any resources that are needed. Um, we also have crisis counselors on teams in each region of Georgia. So we have, so like the, as myself, we do presentations or we go out to community events and we talk to people in the community that way as well. And then we also have a media liaison who runs different social media sites and, and different things like that. So to get started with today's presentation, we're gonna start out talking about what is stress. Um, stress is a physical, chemical, or emotional factor that causes bodily or mental tension and may be a factor in disease causation. With stress, there are common causes of stress in children. A lot of times, you know, as adults, we look and we feel like children can't really be stressed or we don't feel like they get as stressed out from what we feel stress is, but there are several different common causes of childhood stress, be it school, any academic pressures such as testing, like I know testing is going on, you know, right now or was going on last week. And I think some of this week for children at school and testing anxiety is real. You know, kids can feel like the pressure to do good. I have to do good. I have to pass or I have to meet a certain requirement, which can cause that child stress. Changes in the family. You know, during COVID-19, we had a lot of people losing family members or losing friends, and those changes bring about stress. Bullying has become a very big thing in schools now. And, you know, schools are now having a zero tolerance policy for bullying, but, but that is also something that causes stress. Catastrophic events, COVID-19, or, you know, if some, uh, you know, an area is hit by a tornado or different things like that causes stress. 
instability of parents, popularity at school, kids wanting to be popular or they're already popular and they're trying to keep up that popularity, an overly packed schedule. I know me as a, as a parent and as an adult, when I have multiple things going on and my calendar is just full, it causes stress. So just imagine that stress being on a child as well. There are certain movies and books that children will watch, or even the news. If if the news is on at home um, and children see the different things going on in the world on the news and they really may not have an understanding, or even if they do have an understanding, it can be stressful. And also abuse is stressful for children. How to identify stress and anxiety. So on this slide, I have two different changes that we can look at in children to to identify is it stress and anxiety in that child. We have behavioral changes that come when children are stressed. You also have physical changes that come when children are stressed. Um, And these are things I wanted to add these because a lot of times when we're looking at children, we see behaviors change and we don't know why And, you know, sometimes you may be quick to get on to them or punish them for the behaviors that they're doing. But in reality, we need to look a little deeper to see why did this behavior change? What has recently happened in this child's environment or in this child's life that their behavior changed? So some of these behaviors that you may notice when a child is stressed out or some behavior changes to look for when you think that your child is stressed or is dealing with anxiety, look for moodiness. Are they short-tempered? Are they aggressive? Are they clingy? Look for um, development of a nervous habit. Um, Biting nails, twisting hair, picking at sores or just picking at your fingers, um, wringing your hands. These are different things that could be a nervous habit, shaking their foot. Does the child have difficulty concentrating at school or even at home on different activities, family activities that may be going on, but the child is struggling to concentrate or talk to your child's teacher? Is is the child struggling to concentrate at school? Has this always been a thing or is it just something that's currently changed? Um, There are fears that you have behavioral changes with fears that come along with stress. You know, all of a sudden, is your child now scared of the dark? Do they, you know, are they wanting to be alone more or are they scared to be alone? There's also getting in trouble at school, hoarding items of seeming insignificance, uh, refusal to go to school. I've seen this a lot of times with kids that are being bullied at school or, you know, they they start hating school. They feel like I, I just can't go. And it Sometimes it's because of a bully or sometimes it it could be because of the work and they don't know how to ask for help. Withdrawing from family and friends is another behavioral change to look for, especially if this child was once very outgoing with family and friends and now they're just choosing to be by themselves. And I know we do see this sometimes, especially with teenagers, withdrawing from family more so than friends. But I always encourage parents, have time set out to talk to your child at all stages of life just to try to stay connected with them. So some of the physical changes that you may notice in children that are stressed or anxious could be bedwetting. Now, if your child is of a certain age, you could expect accidents if they're younger, you could expect some accidents. However, as you're, you know, as children get older, there's no longer bedwetting. If your child is wetting the bed um, you know, more often than, than what you feel it, it's accidental, something could be going on with that child. Um, complaints of stomach aches and, or headaches. I, you know, working in the mental health field, I've seen, you know, worked with children and you go visit the child and their parents, like they always complain about stomach aches and headaches before going to school. There's a stress, there's a stressor. And when you get down in conversation with that child or teenager, 
and really find out what is the root of it, what is causing this, it's something that is making them anxious in that environment and they're not wanting to go. Has there been a decrease or an increase in appetite? Has there been some problems with sleeping, um, not able to go to sleep or go to sleep and unable to stay asleep? Have they been having nightmares? Um, if your child also, some other physical changes that would I would consider way more serious would be chest pains, increase in heart rate and quickening breaths. These are definitely signs that your child could be having panic attacks um, from anxiety and stress that they're feeling. So is it stress or is it at a point where we can now say that there, this is mental health? So let's see, stress is not a mental health condition. I just, I put that there because I wanted to make sure everyone knows stress is not a mental health condition. Stress and mental health are two different things. We all feel stress, but that does not mean that it has now turned, that it is something wrong with our mental health. We all feel stress. A lot of times we just have to focus on how we deal with stress. So it tends to have an obvious trigger, like a movie, divorce, or illness. Stress typically resolves as life events change. However, stress can lead to mental health problems like anxiety and depression if it persists over long periods without relief. Say you're, you know, you're dealing with stress and the like maybe it was a project you finish that project now that stress is gone it's not a mental health condition or you know you have something major and a major event coming up or a surgery or anything of that nature coming up and you're stressed about it and then the stress of it goes away that's not a mental health condition it becomes a mental health condition when the stress turns into anxiety that is interrupting everyday life or depression that is interrupting everyday life and sadness that you can't come out of. And it persists over a long period of time. I would say if you're feeling these symptoms for a month or, and it's going into longer, you, it's definitely time to look at, okay, I think I may be dealing with something a little more than stress. Negative psychological effects of quarantine during the COVID-19 pandemic. So of course, you know, in 2020, when COVID-19 hit, we had, to, we had to quarantine and shelter in place and it completely changed everybody's life. If you were not used to being stuck in your house all day, every day, only able to go to say the grocery store, it was a major change and it could, it negatively affected millions of people all over the world psychologically. It um, began causing post-traumatic stress symptoms, especially if you were watching the news and you're seeing the number of people passing away from COVID-19 steadily rising. And then you're hearing about children and then you're hearing about, you know, the effects of this and the effects of that. And then also, you know, added on top of COVID-19, you had to listen to political um, things that were going on and deal with racism that was going on. So there were several post-traumatic symptoms that came about during quarantine for a lot of people, as well as confusion and anger. Because, you know, sometimes we, okay, we hear this and then we hear this. And it was like COVID-19 was ever changing and the information coming out about it was ever changing. So it did make it um, confusing and it made people angry to not know what was going on, to not know what to expect. So some other stressors that came about due to COVID-19, I have listed here, um, which were longer quarantine periods than expected. You know, no one expected to still be dealing with COVID-19 two years later. Um, and even though we're not quarantined, you know, you're still, you, we still weren't expecting it. People also had fears of infection, 
you deal with frustration and being bored and inadequate supplies, which is still, you know, still a stressor that a lot of us deal with, inadequate supplies that we may need, or you go to the store and you're unable to find. Um, I know right now, you know, new mothers with babies are struggling to find formulas. So they're still dealing with stressors due to due to it be COVID-19 or inflation, which all these things came about around the same time. Inadequate information and, you know, a lot of people dealt with financial loss as well or are still dealing with financial loss as a stressor because of COVID-19. So some of the tips to manage that stress in children or even in yourself as an adult would be to create a relaxed environment in your home. Um, because of course, outside of your home can be very chaotic. It, these days, it seems like, you know, everyone is stressed out and everyone is just on edge due to, you know, coming out of quarantine and trying to move past COVID-19. Everyone is on edge on when they're out and about and being around people. Some people still of course, wear their mask because they're still nervous about, can I contract it? Some people don't wear their masks. Everybody has their different opinions. So try to create a very relaxed environment inside your home where you can feel safe. And some of the ways to do that would be commit to a routine of a time that, you know, you start your day in the morning, how you start your day in the morning, how the kids start their day in the morning. A lot of times our day is shaped by how we wake up <clears throat> and get started. You know, are we waking up, everybody fussing in the house, or are we waking up and, you know, we're all happy. We're, you know, trying to maybe do positive affirmations in the morning with the, with the whole family to just start out and have a good day. Make sure your home is calm, safe, and secure. <clears throat> Make sure that children are feeling safe. Like they can, this is a place where I know I'm safe. I can talk <coughs> to my parent and I can share how I'm feeling. Monitor your child's tech time. Um, iPads, tablets are a, a great escape for children. It gives parents time to maybe go do something else they need to do, or, you know, just give the children time to decompress from the world. However, they are still taking in different things. <coughs> Excuse me. But we have to monitor that tech time and what the child is watching and taking in. Are they, you know, are the things they're taking in negative? Are the things they've taken in positive and adding to, you know, their educational experience? What things are they taking in during this tech time? Because tech time can be a stressful time, depending on what your child is taking in and how long they're on that tech time and how often they get tech time. Make time for fun. <coughs> Make time to do fun activities as a family, make time to maybe go on a walk as a family or cook as a family or, you know, do arts and crafts as a family. Just make time to sit down where it doesn't have to be serious. Maybe a movie night where you sit down, have a movie, eat popcorn and just enjoy each other's time. <clears throat> Keep the child involved. Allow for your child Allow for opportunities for your child to control the situation, such as picking out appropriate school clothes. This can help manage stress because, for one, it's helping your child learn how to make decisions. Two, your child knows what they want to wear and what they're going to feel comfortable in for that day at school. When your child is feeling comfortable and confident in themselves, it can decrease the stress that they may feel. But we do also want to make sure that the clothes are appropriate for school or for whatever activity they may be doing. Let your, know, let your child know about changes that are going to take place. Maybe 
there's an appointment coming up. Let your child know about that appointment that's coming up. I myself have a six-year-old and I always let her know when she has a doctor's appointment because I'm trying to help her manage the the stress and anxiety of getting shots or, you know, what's going to happen at this doctor's appointment. Um, and like she currently, she has a doctor's appointment coming up soon for an allergy, for allergy testing. And I've had to explain to her because of course, no child really likes getting shots, but I want her to know this is a, this is what's going to happen at this appointment not only changes about, you know, not only about appointments coming up, but let children know about changes that are going to be happening in the home. Children don't have to know all the details down to the very last drop. However, you know, just giving them just a bit of information to help them feel comfortable with what's going on always helps manage stress. It always helps manage behaviors as well. Allow your child to participate in social clubs and sporting activities. Um, you know, I don't know. I know some schools may still have act, some act sporting activities or social clubs that are not going on or that are going on. Most people, I think, are back in to doing the sporting activities and everything now. And it's good for your child to have that social time with sports and social clubs at schools to help manage stress because they're getting a chance to decompress from the school day, but also still hang out with friends in a different setting than being in the classroom at school. <clears throat> Some more tips um, for, you know, managing stress. Here are some tips for, from the parents standpoint of things that parents can do to help manage child stress or teenage stress. Help your child create healthy habits, be it exercising, healthy eating habits, or, you know, just healthy behaviors in general. Provide affection and encouragement. All children need perfection and encouragement. Children thrive off of structure, even structure in homes. If you have structure and a routine, you, will, you can notice a change in your child's behavior and the way that they will thrive. Use positive reinforcements. When your child is, you know, a lot of times people may focus on, a lot of times we may get onto our child, but we don't recognize when they actually did something right or, you know, when they did put up their toys without, you know, without us asking or, you know, that teenager did come home and sit right down and do their homework without the parent having to say anything. Let's use a positive reinforcement to, you know, say, oh, I'm so, you know, I'm so proud of you. You came home and you got right to your homework. Thank you so much for doing that. Or, you know, thank you so much for picking up your toys. I really appreciate that. It positive reinforcement goes a long way with children and teens. Listen to your child without judgment. Um, just be open. Children these days have exposure to a lot of things through technology and TV. Just be open to listen to your child without judgment and have a conversation. This makes children trust you more because they a lot of times children already trust you because you're their parent. But when they can come and talk to you, they trust you even more, especially if they know I'm not going to get in trouble for talking about this. And, you know, I know that my mom and dad, my mom or dad can help me with what we're talking about. They, they'll be more apt to come to you if you listen without judgment and, and just listen, take in what they're saying, and then, then respond um, and just let the conversation flow. Look for new signs, behaviors of unresolved stress. Um, this could be maybe something happened a few months ago. Look for any behavior changes in the child to see, you know, are they still responding the same way? Or, you know, have they gotten better with the way that they're handling the situation? Or, you know, do, I, do we need to look into maybe... Maybe my child needs to talk to someone 
um, because there, there's still some unresolved stress from whatever the event may have been. Here are some different activities. Um, we, you can, they can be considered coping skills, just different activities to do either with your child or you know, teach the child or teen how to do these activities and allow them to do these activities. Um, or you know, everyone in the family can do these activities together. Journaling, if the child is old enough to write, um, journaling can be helpful to write out how you're feeling. If you don't want to actually say the words of how you're feeling, write out how you're feeling. And a journal doesn't necessarily have to be shared. It's, it's that person's inner thoughts and feelings. If you feel that there may be the child or teenager is in some danger, then yes, I would suggest looking at the journal. I would suggest talking to the child and seeing, you know, you know, hey, I think it would be nice if I could just, you know, read how you're feeling. It's not necessarily we something something we have to talk about. If I see something that concerns me, I do want to talk to you about that though. You have to um, let the child feel like they do have some some sort of relief that they're not going to get in trouble for writing it and and putting out how they really feel. Learn mindfulness. Mindfulness is an activity of just being in the moment and coming back to the moment that you're currently in. Um, mindfulness can be used. Um, I've seen people use it with people having panic attacks, like they they're panicking about something and you you're trying to get the person to breathe deeply to help calm them down, first of all, and then bring them to a place where they can be calm. Doing yoga as a family um, is a good coping skill to help manage stress and anxiety. Developing a garden together, um, you know, planting, planting together, watching it grow, taking care of it, you know, just learning about the different things and the seasons that they grow in. This could be a stress relief as well. And then completing school assignments together. Um, even if you may not understand your child's your, or your teen's school assignment, maybe, you know, Googling it together and finding out, okay, this is how we can complete this. Okay, let's work on this. <clears throat> you know, I'll help you. We'll get, you know, we'll figure out what we need to do to help get it complete. That way your child is not feeling like they're completely stressed out because they're fig having to figure out work on their own or they, maybe they didn't understand it at school. Some kids may not have understood it at school. They didn't ask for help, but when they get home, maybe they're more comfortable asking a parent for help. And maybe we can sit together and figure out this is what needs to be done to complete this assignment. So when should you seek help for your child or yourself when dealing with stress? So this first one with poor or delayed language development, when you're looking for this sign in a child, usually this is when your child is much younger, around the ages, you know, one, two, when children start talking and using words. If you're noticing poor or delayed language, it may or may not be stress, depending on what that child has been through. It could also be a sign of something else. So there, that is a good time to seek help if your child has delayed language development. Problems listening or behaving. Um, this could be in a child of any age from, um, you know, the time that they start out until 18. If they're having trouble listening or behaving, it could be something to look further into. Um, sit down and have a talk with that, you know, that child and see if you can possibly talk to them to find out, you know, what's going on. And if it's something that you're, you as the parent are having trouble figuring out, maybe it's time to seek help from a mental health professional. Trouble sitting still, hyperactivity. Um, with this one, I like to tell people children of a certain age are supposed to have a lot of energy. They just are, 
you know, a, a six year old shouldn't be as tired as someone that's 56 years old. It, I mean, you, you, at six years old, you have a lot of energy. You can go and go and go. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a problem with hyperactivity. However, when the hyperactivity um, interferes with daily life, such as completing tasks, that is when that that is when it is time to seek help. Problems concentrating. Um, of course, you know, smaller children have short attention spans, so they may have some issues concentrating. But pay attention to is this an ongoing issue, even as my child is getting older? Am I noticing it with every activity that my child does, that they're not concentrating on any of the activities that they're given? Then it is definitely time to seek help. Is your child having trouble with friends and other children? This could be, is your child having trouble with friends that they haven't had this trouble before? This is something new that's starting and they just can't seem to get past, you know, whatever the trouble may be. Or is this something that you've noticed that your child has always had trouble with friend, with making friends or with other children? And then it could be time to seek help. Does your child seem to be irritable, sad, and grumpy most of the time? Five out of seven days a week, is the child sad, irritable, and grumpy and struggling to be happy? Do, does the child laugh about anything? Does the child find happiness in anything? If you notice that they do not, it is definitely time to seek help because the stress is going from stress to it's past stress and anxiety. It's moving into depression. And we don't want depression to, we want to try to put a handle on things as soon as we can. Seek help as soon as you can. Um, for a better outcome. Is the child having trouble with sleep? Are they not sleeping well at all or are they sleeping too much? Um, you know, at, at a younger age, children need more sleep. As they get older, they start not to sleep so much. And then of course, you know, teenagers, a lot of times they sleep a lot longer. However, if you notice, if you put your child on a routine of when to go to bed and the time that y'all wake up, if they're still sleeping more in between those times, it could be something that you need to look into if they just feel tired all the time. Could be a physical health problem, maybe not necessarily stress. Are you noticing any interruptions with eating? Is the child eating too much? Is the child eating too little? Um, signs to look for if your child eats and then has to run to the bathroom, if they become very private about eating, these are things you may want to look into and just kind of figure out, okay, what could really be going on with my child as far as the eating is concerned. Here's some more, here's another list um, continued of when to seek help. Um, being worried or afraid, shy and avoiding people, angry and violent, afraid of school, thinking about suicide, using drugs or alcohol, does things on purpose to get in trouble. Um, uh, children look for attention. They do. Children need attention from their parents and from their loved ones. It helps them grow. It helps them thrive. It helps them know that they are doing something right. It helps build confidence. Um, so if children aren't getting the needed attention in a positive way, they will do negative things to try to receive attention in any way that they can. Um, is there a sudden change in behavior, a sudden drop in grades? and loss of interest in usual activities, such as does your child play sports and, and then all of a sudden, yeah, I'm not feeling like going to football or basketball practice today. And then that day turns into two days that I don't go. It turns into three days that I don't go. What is causing this loss of interest in this activity that made you so happy at one point in time? These are all signs that you need to seek help 
sooner rather than later. So this is a list. I have all counties in the region that I am the team lead for. And I know that this is just Clayton County. So here in this top corner are the Clayton County resources. There are far more resources than this in Clayton County. These were just some of the ones that I know I have heard about that I've either talked to someone at or, you know, I've built relationships with these different, with different people from these different resources that provide mental health, uh, ongoing mental health services in the Clayton County area. Um, so you have the Community Service Board. Um, there's two for the Clayton Center. You have Phoenix Behavioral Health, Riverwood, and Apex, um, all of which you just contact them, let them know this is what's going on, make an appointment. Most of the time, your first appointment will be a mental health assessment, just to talk to you, gain information about you, gain knowledge about you or your child to see what is currently going on. Why do you feel mental health, ongoing mental health services are needed? And when I say ongoing mental health services, it doesn't mean it has to be services for the rest of your life. It could be services just for three to six months, just to work through whatever the stress or anxiety is that has maybe moved past stress and anxiety more so on its way to depression or it's a stress and anxiety that's interrupting your daily life. And now we have time for questions. Thank you for that, Ashley. Uh, so I am seeing one question here in YouTube. Mm -hmm. on YouTube and this person is asking how can they monitor and reach their own teenage children that don't talk much about issues at all? So with teenagers it can it can definitely be tricky um because teenagers a lot of times don't talk much at all but what I have come to learn with talking to teenagers they need to feel safe they need to feel like they're not being judged about what it is that they're talking about. They need to feel like their parent is going to be open to listening to what they say um, and not get on to them for what they're saying and, and just allow the teenager to be open and honest. Um, and it's just got to start with open dialogue. It may take time. Maybe it's just going to be a daily thing of, hey, you know, how is your day today? Or how is your day going? How have things been going? And if they give you one or two word answers, try to keep asking open-ended questions where they can't answer yes or no, where they have to give an actual answer um, that, that could possibly lead you, the parent, to asking more open-ended questions that can start a conversation. But with a teenager, they want to see that they're going to be comfortable talking to you first. So it may not be that you can just come straight out and ask the question of, you know, okay, what's wrong? Or I need you to talk to me and tell me whatever it may be. You have to kind of wiggle in there and just ask, you know, starting questions, Hey, how was your day? Hey, how is this going? Hey, I remember you telling me about such and such. How did that work out? And give them questions where they cannot say just yes or no. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just a quick follow-up to question that I have to ask. How would you, um, if you were talking to teenagers right now, since this person asks about teenagers, uh, what would you tell them to do? Or where would you tell them to go um, if they're feeling stressed? Or how would you get them to understand that they are in fact feeling stressed and where they can actually go and, and get some assistance? Because before it turns into depression, as you mentioned earlier. So if I'm talking directly to teenagers, it's going, you know, 
first is going to be, are they exhibiting any of the signs that we talked about during your presentation? Am I noticing any of those signs or symptoms or are you yourself as a teenager you know teenagers we can talk to them are you yourself feeling any of these ways of course you have to sit and have a dialogue with the teenager um and if they are if they do come out and say yes I am feeling I feel fear I feel fearful of this this or this or I have been feeling sad I've been struggling with you know these different things and honestly, on where to get help, I feel like it depends on what is it that they're struggling with. Are they struggling with an assignment in school? If that's the case, go to that teacher one-on-one, -on -one, maybe after the class or at the end of the school day, talk to that teacher and let them know this is what I'm struggling with. Or go to your school counselor. That's what they're there for. The school counselor is there to help guide you if you're needing academic help or even if you're needing mental health help the school counselor can lead you in that right direction now is say you're out of school and it's the summertime who can i go talk to you talk to your parent or if there is a trusted adult in your life that you can talk to talk to that person but as a teenager to get mental health services in place, your legal guardian will have to know what's going on to help sign you up for those ongoing services to see a therapist or to get medication if that is what's needed. Okay, okay thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see anything else in either of the chat boxes. And so with that, if you would allow me to share my screen, Ashley, you would stop sharing I, yours. I have one other slide okay. that I wanted to okay. show. Yes. Um, yes. Well, this slide is just the sources that were used um, throughout making this presentation. Um, and then this is the last slide. This is my work cell phone number and my email address where I can be reached at either or. And the banner that you see at the bottom is also the banner that you see behind me. It's the emotional, the COVID emotional support line that is set up through with the Georgia Recovery Project. You can call or text this 800 number sun, any day of the week, Sunday through Monday, um, Monday through Sunday from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, and a crisis counselor will answer and then help with whatever is needed at that time or whatever resources you're needing provided. And that is, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Just a quick question out of curiosity. Um, is there any at home type or in-person type visits? So not from the crisis counselors aren't going from home to home, say as like someone that's providing ongoing services. However, say you see the Georgia Recovery Project set up at a community event in your area, then you can definitely come over to the table that we have set up and talk one-on-one -on -one with one of the crisis counselors at the table and we can provide you with resources at that time. Um, we can provide you with a flyer and any other information that we can give you at that time. We could definitely provide those, that one-on-one -on -one contact there. But, and also we provide one-on-one -on -one contact. Say like someone calls my cell phone number that I have posted here. I can definitely you know, talk with them one-on-one -on -one while we're on the phone. And if I feel like at the end of that conversation, they're going to need more services or ongoing, they need to talk to someone ongoing, I will definitely make recommendations of different resources um, for them to seek more help. Great. Thank you for that, Ashley. Yes, ma'am. Now I will stop the screen share. Okay. Okay, and I just wanted, um, just as a wrap up, um, 
just keep in mind, audience, that the library do have quite a, a large amount of resources um, that you can access. And here's one of the books that we have available for check out with your Pines card. That is Mind Kind, Your Child's Mental Health, written by Dr. Joanna North. Again, that is available for check out as well as many other titles. Just visit our Pines website and see what is available that you can place on hold or um, take out at your local library. Um, and Ms. Ashley, with that, I would like to thank you very much for this presentation. I'm hoping that our patrons are able to um, tap into the resources that you shared with us um, as we're seeing a lot more issues happening with our children with regards to, to mental health. So thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay.